<laughs> I've just been left totally on my own here, unfortunately. Um, two seconds. Jeezy peeps. That is Hamish away, and I'm, I'm caught in one window now. Um, so I'll have to go like this and speak to you like this. The quite stunning scenes from last night's post-match live reaction as my internet connection went down. It didn't even. I just wanted to see what John would do. Um, he did a sterling job, I think it's fair to say, but uh, I couldn't let him away with that peer into the side, into the other window. So, yeah. Okay, as promised last night when I eventually got my signal back, today's video will be a look back at the 2-1 victory over Livingston with the help of your thoughts. As always, the place to start is with the league table and we're back to nine points clear. We've still just dropped those three points in Paisley all season. We can burst through the half century mark in less than half a season with victory over St. Johnson on Saturday. Um, anyway, last night I, I promised 10 viewer comments. I'm now doubting whether there are 10 here, but we'll, we'll find out, I guess, if you want to keep count. We're starting with Uncle Nobby's Steamboat. What a place to start. Just a quick point, this was only our second competitive game after five weeks off, so I'm hoping we're firing on all cylinders on Saturday. And also Sean Ross uh, saying poorest second half this season. So this kind of uh, sums up, I think, how people are feeling at the moment with those two different uh, schools of thought. I would say there's been a fair bit of criticism last night in our comments. I'd say more of the comments are kind of negative uh, than positive. Certainly on some of the forums that I frequent, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, very negative criticism for the likes of Yakimakis, for Moy. Uh, for O'Reilly, for even Kyogo last night. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's this point of the season that we get virtually every season when matches become a little bit sticky, the football isn't quite as good, isn't nearly as good, and it's all about winning. Um, we had these games last season, people maybe forget that because at the end of the campaign we were winning 4, 5, 6, 7 nil most weeks. But, you know, this time last year... There was a lot of narrow, narrow victories. Even go back to the best league season we've had in, in recent memory, 2016, 2017, the Invincible season. There was a lot of sticky matches in this period of the season. I was looking it up, actually, and we had three home games in a row uh, around the Christmas period against Hamilton, Dundee and Partick Thistle. Uh, three teams who are obviously no longer in the top flight. And all of them were won by a single goal uh, and I doubt you'd be able to tell me much about any of those matches. So this is just what happens, happened last season. I guess the team have just set such high standards that we just expect them to kind of turn up and be at their best every single week because that's kind of what they were like at the start of this season and at the end of last season and that's just not going to be the case. Um, this part of the year, as far as I'm concerned, is all about not chucking away daft points and touch wood, we're, we're not doing that so far. We're doing well, we're winning matches and hopefully we can keep it up. Next up, Murney 10. Kyogo scored a good goal but he's a luxury player. The amount of balls flashed across the box and he was nowhere to be seen. He misses far too many chances and doesn't contribute very much to the game. I mean, each to their own. I think, personally, that's a bit harsh. I thought he could have scored a hat-trick in the first half had he gambled a little bit more. That was something that Ange actually spoke about after the game. Not talking about Kyogo, I don't think. I think more talking about midfielders and wingers. Well, actually, we'll talk about this at the end of the video. Um, but even though things weren't really coming off for Kyogo yesterday, uh, I think he still offered a lot for us defensively. The amount of times he pressed Livy, uh, you know, really high, won the ball back. He, there was one when he kind of won the ball back, you know, on the halfway line. So I don't think you can describe Kyogo as a luxury player. I think he's anything but a luxury player. But I agree, he could, he could be playing better, he could be doing more. I think he could be scoring even more goals than he's scoring at the moment. But generally last night, I thought it was a good, you know, 
um, team performance from him, if that makes sense, even though he didn't necessarily do a whole lot besides his goal. Um, I thought he really helped you know, the team in that attitude, especially in the first half. Uh, Cosimo Chinchota, no idea if that's right, but Ralston and Abada combo looks great. This will be a great second half of the season. I do actually really like those two. Ralston is very good at finding passes in behind. Certainly more so than Juranovic. Um, very different kinds of players, but Ralston is very good at those reverse balls kind of in behind. He did it a lot on Saturday. In fact, I think it's for the Kyogo missed chance. He plays this sensational ball in behind for a badder. Carbon copy of it last night for the second goal. Just a lovely pass, and I think it's crucial that we have the ability to do that against defences that are kind of tightly packed, that we can use the space when we do get it and do it quickly, rather than feeding it into midfield, side to side, wee bit pedestrian like we were last night. I think when we're at our best, when this Celtic team's at its best under and it's when we're doing quick and of things like that. Uh, the first goal as well isn't quite as spectacular, obviously, but again, it's Ralston out to Abada into the box and Obelai puts it into his own net. So those two, as far as I'm concerned, kind of won as the game last night with, with their impact. Um, just on Ralston, by the way, Ange did maybe seem to suggest it's not too bad an injury. Uh, the quote was, hopefully it's nothing serious. So I think we'd all echo that. Uh, Green Lichty is up next. 3-5-2 if Ralston's not fit for the weekend. Uh, as we say, hopefully Ralston is fit. If not, not sure if I see that. Uh, I know some people have commented, I think two last night, saying James Forrest has played right back. I uh, don't think he's played right back. I think he's played uh, right wing back in a 3-5-2, so potentially that's what you meant. I'm not sure if I see Ange kind of ripping up his whole, uh, you know, plan effectively just because Ralston uh, or another right back isn't available. Probably, I know people mentioned Jens as well as I played there in the past. Carter Vickers, as I said last night, certainly has. Uh, hopefully Ralston's back. If not, I, I think he possibly does the same again and puts Taylor at right back and Bernabe at left back. It's hardly ideal and I know Ange was keen to point out the irony of having three right backs on our books now and having potentially none of them available for the weekend, but that's just the way it goes. Um, maybe we just dress Alistair Johnson up as Ralston um, and see if we get away with that, potentially. That's kind of the only plan I've got other than maybe Greg Taylor at right back. Next up, Andy Boy. Maybe not the greatest game, but we did deserve the win despite VAR doing their level best to stop it. And so it begins. I kind of uh, figured we'd be talking about VAR. We've done well to get to this point without mentioning it. Uh, I've taken a look at the offside, I guess, the, the Abada goal last night. Bit of a strange one. First of all, I just want to say Abada is definitely offside. So we can tick that one off. Then it comes down to the issue of interference and perhaps the, the reason why it took, I think, 114 minutes for them to decide last night that Abada was, was indeed offside and why the referee ran off the pitch for the best part of an hour. Um, does he interfere before or after the Levy defender messes it up? Now, some would argue that Abada being there has put the Levy defender off. Others would probably argue that he's not active until the Levy defender messes up, if that makes sense, and therefore not offside. My big thing here away from the offside that I don't see many people talking about is that if he is offside, which of course is a decision that was given, why are we not getting a free kick for the challenge in Turnbull two or three seconds later? I mean, it's the most stick-on free kick ever that they just seem to completely forget about. Uh, Sean Hunter adding his thoughts on it. He says, if Abada hadn't tried to pressure Boyce, who's the, the Levy defender, then I think you'd be spot on, John. He did go towards the ball, put pressure on, though, so he was interfering with play, coming back from an offside position. That's the way I read the situation. And I think on top of everything, the, the way VAR is being used, the time it has taken, the fact that it did, all joking aside, take, I think, five minutes for them to decide that. And we then had to defend seven minutes of stoppage time with a narrow lead at the end as a result of that. Um, doesn't 
seem to to help everyone's perception of how VAR is working. But we'll park that for now and, and no doubt come back. Pat Morrissey getting involved. Uh, watched the game back this morning. Number of times there was nobody at the back post for balls coming in was noticeable. Thought CCV was immense. Moy and Turnbull on at the end sucked all the fluidity out of the game. The whole thing was noticeable for Ange too. He described it as unacceptable. The quote is, uh, we created good chances, but people in the box weren't doing their jobs. Balls flashed across goal, but people weren't there. It's disappointing because we work on that constantly. We've had a lot of success playing that way so when it doesn't happen I get frustrated because there's no reason we shouldn't do it. It's not clinical, it's just being disciplined and being in those areas. We still created chances but those numbers should be greater if we got on the end of things. It's unacceptable, we work on it constantly so players know they should be in that area. Now unacceptable is a particularly headline grabbing word. Uh, it's not any surprise therefore to see a lot of the papers and online publications leading with it. Um, it's defined as not satisfactory or allowable. I've no idea why this has turned into dictionary corner by the way. Um, but I think not satisfactory or allowable is pretty fair from Ange. Um, I'm not sure why it's happening right now but I think if Ange is mentioning it in the press and is kind of speaking like I haven't heard them often speak. I haven't really heard them even use a word like unacceptable at all really uh, publicly to do with his own players. Then I think we can maybe have a wee bit of a guess at how he's acting inside the dressing rooms. I think there'll be a lot of uh, whiteboards getting thumped and a fair bit of uh, raised voices as well. And I would um, make the prediction that on Saturday we'll see a lot more uh, players getting themselves into the box and maybe a few goals will come from that as well. It's a huge part of how we do things under Ange. The amount of goals that we scored you know, last season, early this season, with people at the back post running in, scoring. I mean, basically every goal we've scored against Rangers in the last like year it has been something like that um so hopefully we see it coming back i'm not sure exactly why why it's not but Ange is on to it which i think is is a good thing as far as we're all concerned right no idea if that was 10 or not but that's your lot for today in fact just before i go i need to give a wee shout out to a couple of people that i am definitely going to give a fright to right now so be prepared it could be you it's john and nicole in singapore Bet you weren't expecting that. Yes, I've heard through um, a number of people. It's been like, well, I was going to say Chinese whisper. It's been like Singaporean whispers. I think Singaporean's the right, the right word to use there. Um, anyway, I've heard from loads of people, uh, including Asim of this parish, uh, a guy called Mark that you met in a taxi, number of other people as well along this chain, that you're uh, big fans of Ange, Celtic, and for some reason, 67, hail, hail. So just want to say thank you for watching. Genuinely, um, it kind of makes us all feel a bit weird when people around the world uh, tune in to, to us daft Scottish people chatting about uh, the club we love. So uh, glad you're along for the ride and hopefully lots of good times to come. Uh, I'm going to leave it there. For now, we'll be back tomorrow looking ahead to St. Johnson, uh, which is on the following day, Christmas Eve, and of course, any other news that comes up between now and then. So um, yeah, nine points clear, everyone. Chat to you tomorrow.